Everybody hear me okay? Yeah. All right, good. All right, firstly, good job getting out to the Cause Bio Rock, everybody. Yay! This is the... It's not the ideal conditions. Normally we like to do it when the tide's lower and it's not as crazy, but you guys did a great job. Give yourselves a bigger hand. Yay! Excellent. All right. And what did we see out there? We saw more diverse stuff, right? We saw more diverse stuff out on the rock than we did here, even though if we look at it, the elevation is a little bit higher. So why might that be? Why might we see, my, my, why might we have seen more diverse, bigger critters and stuff like that out there? Oh yeah, maybe, maybe there's been some dispersal out there. Okay, that's a possibility. Good. What else? Sand movement. Sand. Okay, maybe these guys here are getting scoured and, and, and abused by the geomorphology here, getting like rubbed. Okay, what else? Less humans. Less humans. Yeah. Less humans is probably all those things you guys talked about could be going on, and the sand scour is a real thing, and the fact that these boulders don't set. Right? We talked about them. They move. So. Maybe you start to get big and maybe you survive big for a month and two months and six months and eight months and then a winter storm comes and you get tumbled, right? So it's hard to be big honking individuals in the boulder field, just generally. But uh, that's all real. But another very important factor is us. How hard was it? Was it easy to get out there? No. Was it easy to get to the boulder field? Yeah. So everybody, their brother, every little kid, every little visitor from... Kansas, whatever, and come out and, and touch the boulder field, right? Going out there, there's a natural protection. There's a natural barrier to access. And it's, it's just it's just logistically harder. We got out there, no problem. It was safe, right? But but most people like, ooh, I don't know if I want to go out in the water, right, kind of thing. And so the, the millions of folks that visit this beach can easily get to the rocks. You know, we're talking maybe several thousands of people go out there, right? So... So still a lot of people, but much less. Um, so some of the things that we couldn't really see because of the tide, there's a lot of fantastic diversity here in our, in our intertidal. This is one example. This critter has changed names at least four times that I know of since I started graduate school. Um, it used to be called Astrea, and then called Lithopoma. And now it's, now I believe, I, I don't know, I have to double check. I'm not sure the exact current name is. I think it's Mega Astrea is now the current name. So this is pretty cool. This is another great example of exploitation. The state of California decided in the 80s that we should be eating more of these. This was put on a top 10 list of, of animals called, or organisms called under exploited. So you remember from our lecture what, what, what over-exploited means, right? Maybe there are too many. We're taking too, more than we can replace easily with the population. Under-exploited is, is this very weird idea, which is we need to be taking more of that thing from nature, right? Are they native so, No, this is a native. This is a native. So this is a, long, this is a long-lived individual. So one of the things I did for my PhD is I studied how these guys moved around, and I made molds of them. I made... I made some. I, I made a rubber cast of their of their outside, and then made models of them with cement and put them out underwater and looked at how things colonized on them. If you look, what you'll see is, I'll pass this around in a sec. There's a lot of little teeny small ridges, and those ridges are really great for for catching little floating dispersing organisms and they settle in there. Uh, this and so and this guy's old. Anyone want to guess how old or how how Approximately how old this guy is? 150 years. Oh, not quite that old. Good guess. 25. I like how you're thinking. 25 years. Probably this, this is probably more like 20 to 40 years old, this guy. <laughs> Slow growing. Slow growing. Why would you target a slow growing species as something we should be taking more of? It had to do with, the, with, the, with problems with abalone and the abalone fishermen, and also some of the sea cucumber fishermen, uh, wanting something else. We were displacing them from a fishery because we'd over harvested that fishery and we were trying to find something else they could eat. You can buy these in, in most Asian markets, um, some uh, markets from that specialize in Latin American foods and South American foods. So this will be labeled as abalone, but when you actually read the labels, it's not abalone. So with all of our mollusks, when we eat them, just like the owl limpets, we eat the muscular foot, the thing that holds the organism onto the rock. That's what we, so we cut off the rest of it, 
Some of them are very rubbery and hard to eat. Those we need to pound and, and, and tenderize. This guy is tumbled in the intertidal. So he's like, what? He's hiding right now. This is called an opercule. Okay, so, so, this, so this part is like a regular snail, right? Regular snail, you guys used to like in your garden, like crawling around. So normally the dude would be crawling, his foot would be out here like my hand, and he'd be crawling over the bottom, grazing with a rasping radula, scraping off diatoms, algae, that kind of stuff. As a defensive mechanism, when this guy gets tumbled, he doesn't want to be eaten. And so while as a regular snail would just pull his foot into the shell, this guy has an extra protective layer. So one of the most uh, very, very common things we do with kids at like summer camp at the beach, we find this cover and this cover is a door. Operculum is the name we use for it. So the, the, the trap door is closed. So attached to the bottom of his muscle is this extra flap. So when he pulls his, when he pulls his uh, foot in, the last little bit whoop, pulls this guy closed. And so when this guy dies, obviously the shell floats around, the opercula flo will float around as well. And people find those and they're always like, what are these? So the classic thing for those summer camps is to show little kid, like, what's this? And they make up all these stories and it's a really funky thing. So this is, a, now I believe that the genus is Mega Astrea, but I'll pass it around to you guys and take a look. And we're done, we'll just put him in the water and he'll be fine. He'll, he'll, he'll pop out and be good. Okay, so we went out there, we saw more diverse stuff. We saw chitons, we saw a lot of the limpets that we didn't see in the high intertidal up here. We saw a dead cormorant, right? We saw a dead cormorant. Uh, we saw, um, we saw some Crab. what's that? crabs, sea stars, anemones. An enemy, a lot of anemones out there. Titan. Cool. Titans. What else do you guys see out there for people that, did, that didn't make it out to the rock? Barnacle. Lots of barnacles. Lots of barnacles. Mussels. Uh, when I was walking out, I pointed it. Maybe you guys didn't see, but there are also other starfish out there. Uh, yeah, starfish. Pisaster. Great sign. We have a, an issue with the sea. Another just quick conservation topic is um, is diseases. I don't know if we have time to talk about diseases before the end of the semester, but I'll just say real quick, the starfish brings it up an interesting example. Sea star wasting disease. Anybody heard of this? A few folks. So basically the idea is um, one of the things we're seeing in addition to climate change, we typically think about hotter, stormier conditions, more, more noisy atmosphere. We also seem to be seeing more disease outbreaks right it's confounded with things like covid because we are also we humans are messing with we're we're, we're pushing ourselves into closer co contact with nature as well and so we're getting exposed to things more but this is a great example sea star wasting disease it's broken out under the, in the echinoderms especially our sea stars where they essentially dissolve to death you don't want to touch it they dissolve to death and so um so that seems to be related to temperature um, some of it is a bacteria, some of this we've seen with viruses, some of this we've seen with other things. But the point is, we're also beginning to see more explosions of wildlife diseases or so-called zoonotic diseases um, that, that are hard to model and are surprising us. Thankfully, it looks like this biggest blast of sea star wasting disease, which started in Southern California and it's going all the way up towards the Pacific Northwest, seems to have kind of run its course for now. So we've, we've killed a bunch of sea stars in the last decade. And it looks like either either the conditions are mellow or the individuals that are coming back are resistant. But regardless, it's a rickettsia-like, well, uh, the, never mind, I, I take, take that back. I'm not, I'm, we're not sure exactly what, what is causing it, but it's, it's some kind of disease vector mediated by temperature or, or, or influenced by temperature. So, so yeah, cool. Um, trampling is a big thing. So not only is exploitation an issue like we talked about, but the last thing I want to make sure I touch on is just physical disturbance. You guys mentioned sand scour, total possible. Also, you guys just picked up that, the mega stray, right? Which is cool, right? We're here at Khan's bio class, we're learning about stuff at school. When we're done, we're gonna put it back. Most people are not being jerks, they're not trying to be jerks. They, they're, they're wonder, they're, they're fascinated by the nature here, which is awesome. It's a beautiful place, it's great people come here, but they don't know. So they step, they come out and they step and they accidentally step on something and they squish it, right? Or they pick something up, hey mom, look! And then it moves and ha! And they drop and it cracks or whatever, right? So not intention, not like demonic kids stabbing things with a knife, but just the fact that when there's this many people, this much human pressure, 
unintentionally is going to have a bunch of impact. That can be hard to distinguish from exploitation. That can be hard to distinguish from people actually harvesting something or collecting something, exploiting something to use and incidentally harming it or, or damaging it or hurting it. As far as nature goes, they don't care. It doesn't matter, right? It's a dead dude is a dead dude no matter what. But, but, but trampling, we tend to put in the category of exploitation, even though it's not technically necessarily exploitation. It's an incidental impact. Cool. Other questions you guys have for us or have for me about Leo Carrillo, the intertidal, these beaches in general? What, what are it about? Everybody get to see the Mega Strayer? What? I don't know, just show it to the camera. Oh, you want to oh, look at it? Oh, yeah, look at it. Oh, wow, cool. <laughs> All right, great. Yeah, Izzy. How do they know it's like, wow, like, how, do they how do they grow? So, so what we're looking at is their growth pattern. So we're looking at, so it's called torsion, is the, is the physiological process, where essentially um, I tell this, I send a, a chemical signal to this side and say chill, and send a chemical signal to this side and say grow. And so it has the effect of, of essentially twisting. And so, and so the little individual guy's original shell was here, and then he just lays down more and 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 more, 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 more. So this is a calcium carbonate shell, like, like the, the matrix is calcium carbonate, but it's protected by protein. And so, I don't know if you guys can see it very much on this case, but, but or if you look inside muscles, same thing, you see that mother of pearl stuff? That's a, that's a, that's a seven layer protein that goes down over the calcium carbonate to protect it. So one, it keeps the, the seawater from eroding it, but then two, it also makes it smooth so its, its body parts, its foot doesn't chafe on, you can imagine like a, a, a rough surface would be hard every day moving your foot back and forth. So, um, and that's the same for all of these guys. Same idea for oysters, same idea for mussels, same idea for um, abalone, it's all the same process. That, that when, we, when you guys buy a pearl, if you have an, an, an earring or a necklace or jewelry, that, that's the same exact stuff here, it's just, it's just from oysters that do a particularly good job of, of laying that stuff down. And then with that, when the snail comes out, where is the door down? Oh, the door kind of flaps down. So it'd be like it'd be like it'd be like if I had a door on my knuckle and I, when I close, the knuckle goes up, and then it just sort of is. So it would be like it would kind of like be like like here while he's walking around. Cool. Perfect. Thank you, dude. That's great. Um, 